evening to Dr. Girish, and uh, it's a pleasure to have him with us today. It's it's been a long time. We we made uh, this arrangement long time ago. Uh, we, we actually met uh, two to three years ago in AIUM. Uh, probably that was in Florida, if I'm not mistaken, or that's in New York. Uh -huh. I'm not sure. It always uh, moves back and forth in these two uh, states. Anyway, uh, I'm going to uh, introduce him to you. Uh, Dr. Grace uh, hails from uh, Michigan. He works in in the in the um, in in one of the musculoskeletal radiology. Yes. Yeah, musculoskeletal radiology. In, uh, University of Michigan. Yeah. With Dr. John Jacobson, right, uh, Dr. Yes. Girish, and uh, he's been working with so much research and did a lot of studies. You know, he's got a long list of qualifications here. I can hardly relate to this because this <laughs> is a lot. <laughs> this is just a lot. But having Dr. Girish with us here is really a rare opportunity, and uh, I was encouraging my colleagues to please attend because this is the only time you will be able to understand hernia. For a long time, I, I, I struggled with, with these problems and it's very, sometimes very difficult to weave through difficult uh, uh, cases on uh, hernias. And, but then it's very easy to see Dr. Grish weave through this uh, as if you know everything already when he start lecturing. So uh, it's a pleasure to have you, Dr. Grish. Uh, he's a professor of the Department of Radiology at the University of Michigan. And uh, we welcome you here in our mask ultrasound Zoom meeting. We call this mask because uh, today is a still pandemic. We put mask, right? So that's yes. exactly why we, we put <laughs> the names. <laughs> it's, uh, it stands for musculoskeletal active skills in ultrasound. So mask us oh, nice. Uh, nice. Is, nice. Is, is really what it stands for. And we have heard some uh, colleagues with us and they're, they're your fun actually. Without you seeing them, they're your fan, number one fan. Okay. <laughs> uh, we have her, we have her Jem, we have Pash, we have Michael, and we have uh, Milane. They're all your fans here. So uh, <laughs> uh, we, will, we, will, we will hear them later as they sure. uh, uh, ask you questions. So before we begin, let's uh, have a word of prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful day. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that we can listen to a great lecture by a great professor of the University of Michigan, Dr. Grish Kandikota. Can okay, Lord put words into his mouth that he will be able Lord, to relate to us and make us learn the things that we need to learn as we practice in the midst of this pandemic. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So again, welcome, Dr. Grish. And uh, here you are. Your funds are coming in, but you can start uh, uh, talking now. Okay, cool. Uh, so um, what I will do today is um, I'll give you a brief introduction about how we go about doing the groin hernias. Now, these are not the hernias which the clinicians can feel and palpate and they're comfortable with. These are the hernias which are very subtle. Patient has groin pain. They are not sure if this is a hernia or not. So they are sending us for imaging. Okay, so it is that category. Uh, so we're not going to go into the hernias, which are obvious, obvious, but we are actually dealing with hernias, which could be hernias or something else. If, we are, if I have time, I will also visit a little bit about, uh, talk a little bit about sports hernia too, because there's a lot of confusion about sports hernia and the usual direct hernia, indirect hernia and groin hernias. Is there a relationship? If there is no relationship, then what should we be calling these and so on. So I, hopefully I can, I can touch base with that. And please ask me questions. I, if, I don't answer, if I don't know, I will check and I'll let, uh, no, get back to you. But uh, I can tell you that since we started doing hernias in musculoskeletal ultrasound, we actually do more hernias or equally more equal hernias to shoulders. So that's the number of hernias we are doing we got explosion of uh, cases being referred to us. So if you start doing it, uh, be careful. There will be a lot more cases coming. Now, these are very challenging because there are no great osseous landmarks. There are some, 
but there's not a lot. So my job today is to uh, go through a little bit of anatomy to teach you some landmarks, because once you get through the landmarks and have a defined protocol, it's easier to do these hernias, okay? So I have no disclosures. So the learning objectives would be to describe the sonographic technique of evaluating the groin hernias, the ones which are the subtle ones, and then to identify the sonographic features which help differentiate different types of groin hernias. And these, I include spigelian as well in the groin hernia, but mostly groin hernias mean direct hernia, indirect hernia, and femoral hernia. One might question as to why I need to know the difference between these two. They are different in terms of how they get managed and how, what type of mesh they have to put and so on. So the surgeons would appreciate if you can give them these informations about what type of hernias these are. And then I will very briefly review the sports hernia as well. And in places where I have some time, I will show you some hernia mimics, that is the pitfalls or the examples and so on. So groin pain is very common, present in complaint in adult population, okay? Of that, groin pain is also, uh, groin hernia is a very common cause of groin pain. And that's why you get all these referrals saying, hey, this patient has groin pain, rule out hernia. Over 800,000 hernia roughies are being performed each year in the United States. So that's a lot of hernias. So a lot of diagnosis and a lot of post hernia complications. That's a different lecture. We won't go through that because especially once you have a mesh placed after the hernia repair, the hernias happen through the inframedial aspect of the mesh. So then they don't have the boundaries of the, of the areas that I'm going to talk about. So that's a different lecture. We'll do it some other time. Also with herniorraphies, um, what happens in the mesh is the ilioinguinal and iliohypogastric nerves get stuck. So these are the people who actually can have pain and they may, they may still have normal, I mean, the hernio, hernia fixation is still working, but they'll still have pain. So you sometimes have to inject around the nerves, clear the scar tissue and reduce the pain. All that stuff, some other time, but let us now fix on understanding the anatomy and the simple protocol. History's physical exam for subtle hernias are not always diagnostic and dynamic ultrasound, okay? Not just ultrasound, dynamic ultrasound is sensitive in identifying these hernias. Now, if you do not know how to do this, or if you do not do it properly with the proper technique, your yield will be very low it will be frustrating and you will give up. So, so I have been there. We need to understand the anatomy a little bit and then we can go down. Now, a little bit about myself. I trained as a surgeon before I became a radiologist. For four years, I did surgery. I actually have FRCS, which is a basic surgical degree. While doing surgery, the most common operations you do are hernias and those days we used to do a lot of hydroceles as well. So in this hernia, so I have seen the anatomy in that area, you know, in, in the gross sense. So I understand this maybe slightly better because I, I've spent more time seeing these and doing these things. But once you understand the anatomy, it gets easier to do ultrasound scans. So I recommend 10 to 12 megahertz linear array transducer, so straight one. Um, you can use the virtual convex mode when possible to have the larger field of view, and that helps, but the, I, I don't use this very often, but that is something you can. Now, the critical part is when you're placing the probe on the skin, you use a lot of gel. Don't press too hard, because when you press too hard, the hernia is coming towards the probe in the Valsalva maneuvers. So you, if you press too hard, you will not see any movement coming towards it. So just leave it like that and see if something is coming towards the probe and comes towards the probe and goes this way or not, right? So those are the, um, the options. So light touch of the transducer and a very strong Valsalva manure. Now, most of you know what Valsalva is. It is basically any manure that you do to increase the intra-abdominal pressure. Now with COVID, you have to be careful. You probably cannot ask them to cough or, or even blow in the backside, in the hand, uh, but you can ask them to bear down or crunch head and so on. So just to increase the abdominal pressure. How do you know that he is doing a great Valsalva? 
we'll just go down to the femoral vein cross section and see if the femoral vein is expanding or not. If the femoral vein expands very well, then you're, you're getting a good or strong well salvo maneuver, okay? And also remember, scan them on standing positions and supine positions. Standing positions that can be very difficult. See, super, uh, the understanding the anatomy in supine itself is difficult. And then make stand, everything is floppy. Um, you know, you, you see what I mean? It's not easy to understand. So try to do it supine first and then get your bearings and then maybe make them stand and do it. But you have to do it in standing because we have diagnosed quite a few hernias, which are very obvious on standing and they are not so obvious on supine positions. And now with regards to the probe, don't craniocaudal angulation of the probe, right? Because if you look straight, if you do craniocaudal, what would have been a femoral can become a direct hernia because of the way in which you are seeing it in, in comparison to the transverse ligament, or sorry, inguinal ligament. And I will talk to you in a minute. So don't angle this. If possible, look straight is the one of the techniques. So remember these things. Now let's define the hernia first, okay? And then we'll look do the gross anatomy, sonographic anatomy, sonographic pathology, and we'll see some pitfalls. So what is a hernia? So hernia is a protrusion of a part or whole viscous through a fascia that is contained in it, normally containing it. So if this is peritoneum, and if the bowel comes through the hernia like that, then you have a bowel-based hernia. If the preperitoneal fat comes, then you have a preperitoneal fat hernia. If the liver comes through it, then you have a liver hernia. So basically, you see what I mean? There has to be a defect, and then there has to be something coming through it. So that is what is hernia, right? So if you look at this, this is the um, linea alba. This is the fascia between the two rectus abdominis muscle right there. That is the linea alba. This is the long axis. The probe is placed long. And then here is the long axis. That's the linea alba fascia. That's the linea alba fascia. And there is a defect here. Okay, so this is the defect through which the preperitoneal fat is exiting outside when the person is doing well salva. So like, for example, if he does push, you see this fat's coming through. So this is the, this is the peritoneal layer. So the fat above the peritoneum, deep to the fascia is exiting through the defect into the hernial sac. So this is a hernial sac and this is a hernia neck as defined between the two stars. Now, whatever hernia you name, that name comes from where the neck is physically located in the anatomical plant box. Like for example, this particular piece is in the epigastric region. This is the, the gastric region. This is the epigastric region. So it will be epigastric hernia. If it is in the umbilical area, it will be called umbilical hernia. If it is in this area, in the hiatus semilunaris, it will be called spigelian hernia or direct, indirect, and femoral hernias. And we'll talk about that more often. The content here in this case is fat, but it can be bowel, bladder, or intra-abdominal viscous. Most common content is always fat. So we know now that the hernia is defined by the location of the neck. So let's see a little bit more anatomy. This is rectus abdominis, right? So a spigelian hernia, right? The name spigelian hernia is a delinea semilunaris, and then this is cranial to the, uh, let me move this here, yes. Cranial to the inferior epigastric artery. This is the inferior epigastric artery. So I'm introducing you another landmark. It's not a bony landmark, it's a vascular landmark, but it's a very important landmark for hernia. If you identify the inferior epigastric artery, which you should, you have to identify first below the rectus and then it goes this way until it gets into the femoral artery. It is very important because the deep ring, which is this hole in the fascia transversalis, is through which you get the uh, indirect hernia coming up this way, right? The indirect hernia comes this way through here. That is lateral to the epigastric artery, okay? So indirect hernia comes towards the probe, lateral to the epigastric artery through the deep ring, which is a hole lateral to the inferior epigastric. Medial to the epigastric, this area is called the Hasselbeck's triangle. 
this is where you get the direct hernia, direct hernia coming towards you. This is the inguinal ligament and inferior to the inguinal ligament, you get the femoral. So that is the indirect hernia. This is the Hasselbeck's triangle and direct hernia. And this is the femoral hernia, okay? So those is the anatomy. Now, don't worry about it. We'll come back again, all right? So let us see. Uh, okay. I was just looking to make sure there are no questions here, but we can do the questions later on too. So femoral hernia is here, all right? So let's move on. This is the spigelian hernia at the hiatus semilunaris. This is the hiatus semilunaris, which is a fascia between the rectus abdominis and the obliques, the external oblique, the internal oblique, and the transverse abdominis. So there is the fascia there on the lateral border of rectus abdominis, and that is where a defect in that location, you get spigelium. Now, this is the inferior epigastric artery, and on the other side is indirect, lateral side, the medial side is direct, and this is femoral. Right, epigastric hernias happen here, periumbilical hernias happen here, and then umbilical, and then this is the incisional hernia. Okay, so moving on from the gross anatomy point. Now, these are some bony landmarks you would like to know. Inguinal ligament, because ingui inguinal canal involves the inguinal ligament. Inguinal canal is where the hernia travels. So what is inguinal ligament? It is between the anterior superior iliac spine and pubic tubercles. That is the only two bony landmarks actually which will be palpable in most individuals, okay, most. Um, it may not be palpable in some others, but in most individuals you can palpate anterior superior iliac spine and pubic tubercle. So when you feel that, stuff running between that is the inguinal ligament. Now, the other bony, other landmark that you want to know is a midline landmark for the midline hernias. We already talked about this. It is the linea alba fascia between the two rectus abdominis, and the defect here would be the epigastrics. This is another landmark that you want to know that is between the rectus abdominis and the obliques or lateral border of the rectus. It is a curved line, a semicircular line, and, and it's called a semilunaris. An inferior portion of the semilunaris is where you expect to find the spigelian hernia. So these are important things for you in your mind. I'm spending more time here because once you get these things, you will not be lost, you will not be frustrated, and you will get you know, to the next few phases very easily. Okay. Now, um, this, this is what we talked about. Uh, lateral to the ep epigastric is the indirect. Uh, above the inguinal ligament is direct. Below the inguinal ligament is femoral. Now, two points, right? This is the midpoint of the inguinal ligament. That is midpoint between the anterior superior iliac spine and pubic tubercle, okay? Not the midline, pubic tubercle. This is where you get the deep ring. So if you want to know where the indirect hernia is coming, you need to know where the deep ring is. This is the anatomical landmark. You feel the anterior superior iliac spine, feel the pubic tubercle, and kind of somewhere in between should be the deep ring. This deep ring is usually lateral to the inferior epigastric artery that we talked about. Now let's talk about the inguinal canal. It is a canal through which the indirect hernia travels into the scrotum. Uh, so that starts from the deep ring, that is midpoint of the inguinal ligament, and it goes all the way to the pubic tubercle where there is a superficial ring, then it goes into the scrotum. So that is the inguinal canal that we are interested in, right? And this is the inferior epigastric artery. Now, when you cut through this anatomy, okay, there's a little bit of anatomy you want to know here, is that when you open the inguinal canal, the roof of this inguinal canal or the superficial part of the inguinal canal is mostly contributed from the external oblique muscle. So that's the E called the external oblique. Okay, the deep part of the inguinal canal that is deeper to the spermatic cord is called the conjoint tendon formed by the combination of transverse abdominis and internal oblique. Okay, so they form together and they form that uh, covering here. Weakness of this gives rise to a direct hernia. Weakness of this in the PMNR literature have been also associated with what they have 
thought of as one of the sports hernia. So the guy who does a lot of sports, especially using a lot of the core muscles, moving this way, that way, and so on, they use a lot of conjoint tendon. The conjoint tendon has complex attachments everywhere. If it's weak, the stuff will protrude through it and go into the scrotum through the superficial ring. So that is the importance of conjoint tendon. So if you look at the inferior epigastric artery, that is the inferior epigastric artery we talked about, right? So we will now get into how to identify these structures, inguinal ligament, deep ring, inferior epigastric artery. Let's look at it in a sonographic way. So the inferior epigastric artery is first and best identified deep to the rectus abdominis. Next time you're scanning the abdomen, uh, you will easily identify the rectus abdominis and just keep looking for that. Not only will you have the epigastric artery, you will have some epigastric veins next to it in this particular fashion. And then you follow the probe down in this way. Now, in this particular time, as of now, we're just trying to identify the epigastric and it goes all the way here. Remember, just medial to the epigastric in this particular location between the rectus abdominis and the obliques is where you would see for spigalian. As you come down the epigastrics, lateral to the epigastric artery, as it enters into the femoral artery is where you will see the deep ring and the, and the indirect hernia coming towards you. Like for example, if you see this and you see, you know, you click here, and this is the rectus muscle, right? And you see this vessel here? That is the inferior epigastric artery coming in. I can follow this here, and then there it is. And then as it comes down and attaches to this um, femoral artery, and this is the spermatic cord here, okay? So, when, so let's follow this one more time. There is the vessel, there is the inferior epigastric, here it is. And you can identify this in most places, okay? There it comes, and as it comes down, it is deep to the spermatic cord, and then it goes down like that. Remember, the spermatic cord would have come from here, which is lateral to this, uh, the deep ring, and then it will go this way, okay? So this is purely for you to show the inferior epigastric artery. Now, this is the inguinal ligament. Most places, you cannot see this very clearly, and that's okay. You will just see a little bit of haziness or the fascial thickening. But in this case, you can clearly see the inguinal ligament over the femoral vein, femoral artery. This is the muscle over the pubic rami. This is compactinous muscle. Here is where you have a small little lymph node, which is the lymph node, which is fine. But if there's anything else in this particular location, that will be the perfect location for a femoral hernia, right? So that is the inguinal ligament, which is little inferior to the spermatic cord. Spermatic cord, if you go a little bit more on top of it and don't press too hard, you will see the spermatic cord structures here. And this is the epigastrics going into the, uh, the artery, the epigastric going into the artery and you see the spermatic cord over there, okay? So these are the structures that you want to appreciate before you understand the anatomy very well. Now, um, going further, let us look at the sonographic pathology, right? So first of all, let's look at the spigalian hernia. Now, this is a CT, and uh, if you have done quite a few CTs, you will realize that the defect, that is a full defect between the rectus, this is the rectus abdominis, this is the rectus abdominis on the other side, this is a midline, and the external oblique, internal oblique, and transverse abdominis, the defect between the two, uh, the fat is, coming out into the subcutaneous fat, and this is the subcutaneous spigalian hernia. It's going through and through, so it's a straightforward hernia. There's another type of spigalian hernia, which is can be confusing on ultrasound, and let us understand this type of hernia. It is called interparietal uh, type of spigalian hernia, where there is interplane dissection. What does that mean? So the hernia goes through the transverse abdominis and the internal oblique fascia, but it does not go through the external oblique fascia. It just turns around here. So it goes through this way and it turns around between the internal, external oblique and the internal oblique and lies here. So it is not in the subcutaneous tissue, but the bowel is just deep to the external obliques overlying the internal oblique, okay? So this is called interparietal type interplane dissection, all right? So how does that look like? So if I were to place a probe on the rectus abdominis, which is this, 
and this is the internal oblique and transverse, which is here. This is the fascia of the external oblique. Remember, this is the fascia of the external oblique. So the hernia will come through the gap between the internal oblique and transverse and the rectus, and then will stop here, right? This is the uh, fascia, and it will go in this direction over the internal oblique and transverse. So if I were to do this, see this, it goes this way. So you won't see the hernia coming through the fascia here because that fascia is still intact. However, the hernia has traveled between the rectus and the internal oblique and is taking a lateral direction and going down that way. That is a typical spigillian hernia that you will see, the, the interparietal type of spigillian hernia. So you should be able to diagnose that now that you know the anatomy and how this forms, all right? Comes out and goes in this fashion. It is above the epigastric artery. Okay, there are some pitfalls here, right? For example, if the guy has too much muscles, like big muscles and so on, um, if, if his rectus is this big, his psoas major is also very big. Every muscle is big. So the bowel doesn't have much space. So it is going to squeeze between a certain um, muscles like this. That is between rectus and the other muscle, this the oblique. This is normal. There is no interplane dissection here. It is just squeezing past between the two, but it goes back again. It is not coming through this area. It doesn't come over and go below the fascia. Nothing like that is happening. It is just coming and going back. So that's normal. This is also normal in a, a weak abdomen. Muscle is lax and it's usually in older individuals. It just spreads the rectus and the obliques spread. And then you'll see a lot of um, bowel, almost like a bulge there. That's just a weakness. Again, it is not a special in hernia because it's not going through the fascia and coming over either in the subcutaneous area or between, between the interplane dissection and deep to the external oblique fascia. Nothing like that is happening. It just bulges and comes back, bulges and comes back, and that's okay. That's a normal special in hernia. Let's look at the indirect inguinal hernia now. Remember, we talked about indirect inguinal hernia coming through a deep ring, and we know that the spermatic cord also comes through the deep ring. It's really the hernial sac also comes through here, lateral to the epigastric artery, and then travels over the uh, spermatic cord and then goes through the superficial ring. It is, if you remember the anatomy, the testis descends, and usually there is a process vaginal is with it, and the, the hernia can be filling in this space with contents or fluid. So if you want to identify the deep ring, you want to identify the epigastric and stand a little lateral to it and place a probe lightly and ask the patient to do well salva and see if anything comes towards it. So this is the deep ring. This is the epigastric here. It is not very well seen, but once I put the video on, you may be able to see a little bit of pulsation there. Either way, when, when you do the Valsalva, this is the hernia which comes through the deep ring. These are not easy exams, and then uh, the videos are not coming out well on Zoom as well, but uh, this is the direct, indirect hernia, sorry, coming through the deep ring, okay? It comes through the deep ring. So once you know where it is, you place your probe lightly, you keep the epigastric in focus. You, If you see something coming towards it, then you know that you're dealing with it. Hernia. So that is the place to look for. The other place to look for is to go long axis on the spermatic cord. And I showed you, this is the spermatic cord here. Don't press too hard. And this is where you will see. Because if you press hard, the hernia lives on top, exactly on top of the spermatic cord, and that you will not see at all. So let me take the arrows off. This is where you're going to see the hernia. The hernia will come from lateral to medial, lateral to medial in this fashion. Here it is. This is lateral to medial, and this is where it is heading down to. So this is the hernia. Spermatic cord going from lateral to medial. Lateral to medial. Okay. So that, you see, if you, if you look carefully, you have the spermatic cord, and then the hernia is lying on top of that. Okay. That is the indirect hernia. It comes out through the indirect ring, and lies on top of the spermatic cord and heads towards the pubic tubercle. Pubic tubercle is here. So this is another example. Similarly, there it is. It is going towards the pubic tubercle. This is the uh, indirect hernia. Now, indirect hernia travels this way. Once it comes out of the uh, 
the deep ring, it usually travels parallel to the probe, okay? We'll come back to the direct hernia, which is always going straight to the probe. But if you're traveling something parallel to the probe like this, that's an indirect hernia. Now, the most useful thing I find is actually going cross-section on this spermatic cord. Most people can identify the spermatic cord, just go cross-section on it. You will see it in this fashion and wait, ask the patient to do well salva. And after a while, you will see the indirect sac coming in, filling up and then going back again, in filling up and then going back again. So that is something that, you know I have found very helpful. So if you're completely lost, transfers, Spermatic cord is quite easy. You start doing it here and then you go slowly. Maybe the sac is only coming halfway and not completely and you will identify the sac. Now, remember the hernias are most painful when they are forming, when they are coming and expanding the deep ring, when they're expanding the inguinal canal and they're expanding the superficial ring, that's when they are most painful. Once they create a tract for themselves, they're not that painful. They can get uncomfortable if there's bowel and you press hard on it and so on, or it gets stuck, but they're not very painful. So when patients complain of groin pain, that means it is forming, the hernia is forming. Okay, so it'll be smaller usually. Okay, so the next thing is, so this is this one actually we can catch from deep ring all the way to the superficial ring and the pubic tubercle and it'll travel parallel to the probe. So here it is. There is the deep ring. This is parallel, traveling parallel to the probe through the superficial ring. Okay, so this is the hernia going off. So this is the, uh, the indirect hernia going from the lateral aspect of the artery, coming out, going over the artery, over the epigastrics, uh, going parallel to the probe, going through the superficial ring into the scrotum in this particular case. All right, so the pitfall, right? The pitfall, one of the pitfalls I wanted to highlight is the spy, you know, spermatic cord movement. So sometimes there is, you know, this guy is a carpenter or a bricklayer, and then this. You can, <laughs> okay. you can do uh, whatever you want. All right, cool. Uh, I just hope that I don't lose it again. I don't know what happened. Usually we don't lose uh, uh, the connection, uh, but let's do it. Uh, so, um, you yeah. can see my screen now? Yeah, yeah. So you have to do the share screen. Uh huh. You can see it now, right? Yes, 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 yes. Great. Okay, cool, cool. Okay. Cool. So we were talking, uh, so you saw the spermatic cord, correct? Yeah. Uh, you saw, all right, cool. So I just wanted to let you know that, you know, it does move a little bit and then uh, try not to overcall that, and that is fine. So when we move on, the other thing is, you know, we always get these varicose seals, right? A lot of varicose seals, the small little veins. Always make sure you put the color on and it is obvious these varicose seals here too. And it's not just for the guys, it's even in the ladies. I mean, you can get it through the, the round ligament. And this is the so-called, you know, almost looks like a mass lesion here on CT. But when you put uh, the color on, you will see that the varicose seals going through the deep ring, through the inguinal canal, and into the into the superficial ring in this area near the pubic tubercle. So this is important for you to appreciate, right? So varicose seal is another option. Here, sometimes you know you can have both varicose seal and hernia. Like for example, this is the hernia slowly going in and compressing the varicose seal. So you, you just have to keep looking. Sometimes there is a combination of both happening in that sense. All right, so now, so that was spigillion that we did a little bit of indirect and we had a big break. And then now we're going to the direct hernia. So direct hernia comes towards the probe, towards the probe through this Hasselbeck's triangle called the D, okay? So that is the, the direct hernia and it is medial to the epigastric artery lateral to the rectus abdominis, superior to the inguinal ligament in the region of the uh, spermatic cord, just above the spermatic cord, okay? So how do we identify direct hernia? Now this, listen to me very carefully. You place your probe in such a way that you see the epigastric getting into the femoral artery, somewhere here in this particular line, okay? Make sure that the bladder is not full because if the bladder is full, there's no space for the direct to come. So artificially it is getting blocked. 
So you should empty the bladder. Of course, you're doing well salva, so you don't want to have the accidents. Uh, but also, you need to have the space for the direct to play, all right? So let us assume that this is medial, this is lateral, this is the vessel. You place the probe here straight, and th this is the epigastric, and you will see the peritoneal bulge on both sides with Valsalva. Everything is climbing up towards the probe, including the vessel to a certain extent, like this. Like if you do this, everything comes up, like, like the one you're seeing, this, this particular thing. And th but then that's all staying in the same level as the artery, so it doesn't go up. What am I talking about? So if you look at this, at rest, this is the inferior epigastric artery. At Valsalva, this is the inferior epigastric artery with some mild bulge. In direct hernia, though, at rest, it'll be fine, but medially, the bulge will be asymmetric and more towards the probe than the artery level itself. So let's look at the example. That is the artery here. That is the level of the artery. That is the medial, that is the lateral, medial, lateral. You place the probe here, that's the artery there. That's the artery cut section here, okay? And you ask them to do well salva, which is like crunching or whatever. And you will see next to the artery, you will see a lot of stuff coming towards the probe. Again, don't press too hard. But when you see this much amount of travel of the sac towards the probe, higher than the level of the artery, that's your direct hernia, okay? It is medial to the artery. It comes towards the probe. Remember, in direct hernia, runs parallel from the lateral side of the artery, okay? So that's why we always go back to that artery to identify what type of hernia this is. So this is a direct hernia, all right? So, as the direct hernia comes out and then travels through the superficial ring, it usually pushes the spermatic cord away like it's doing here. So if you had both hernias, and I will show you an example of that, in the canal space, you will have indirect hernia on top of the spermatic cord, and you will have a direct hernia, the bottom level of the spermatic cord, okay? So here is the indirect hernia, here is the direct hernia in this fashion. So let us look at this. This is the inframedial portion. This is the lateral portion. So a indirect hernia will start from travel from lateral to medial towards the pubic tubercle. A direct hernia will come up and travel towards the pubic tubercle. Now remember, when there's one hernia, there's often another one. It is difficult sometimes to see it because if there is a big direct hernia, the small indirect hernia gets hidden, or if there is a big indirect hernia, the small direct hernia gets hidden. So you have to be careful, but look carefully, right? So for example, if you look at this, there is your indirect hernia, but there was also a direct hernia pushing this indirect hernia further away. There is the indirect her direct hernia, but because there is such a big indirect hernia, it gets pushed back, okay? So always remember one thing, that they both can happen. Indirect and direct. So here is another example of what you will see is an indirect coming this way and a direct coming this way. Okay, let me see. That's the artery. There it is. That's the indirect coming parallel to the probe. That's the direct coming towards the probe. And look at this. This is the artery. So this is lateral to medial, lateral to medial. This is medial to the epigastric towards the probe, right? So you see what I mean? The directions are helpful in identifying the lateral and the direct hernia, all right? So as I told you, multiple hernias are quite common, so keep looking, and they make a difference in management depending upon how many hernias you identify. It, it gives them a pre-operative planning of, so how big a mesh to put, how far down you need to come, especially you should identify the femoral hernias. Talking about femoral hernias, we know that the femoral hernia is inferior to the inguinal ligament, that's the inguinal ligament, medial to the vein, and lateral to what's called the lacunar ligament, and overlying the pectineus and the pubic ramus, right? So this is this area. That space, right, the space is usually filled with fat and a, usually a small little lymph node. But if there's anything else, like a hernial sac, then that is a bad news. It's usually bad news for femur, femoral canal region because of the femoral hernia is because the canal space is very narrow. 
right? Therefore, the narrower the neck, the more chances of getting uh, obstructed or strangulated. And, you know, remember one thing, uh, a strangulation means ischemia is happening in the hernial sac or the hernial content, okay? Obstruction means the hernia does not move anymore, it is stuck, all right? Incarcerated also means the same, but in obstruction, there may be bowel obstruction as well. So you got to be worried about it. So the degree of urgency is if you call it strangulation, that needs immediately going to the surgeon, perhaps a surgery. Obstruction is some amount of seriousness is involved. You want to make sure the bowel is not completely obstructed. So you want to talk to the surgeon and say, hey, the bowel is there, it is not moving, it may be obstructed. The difference between obstruction and strangulation is usually in the sac you see in you know, fluid, more fluid, uh, and you're thinking it's getting more serious. The fluid is usually outside the bowel, around the bowel, around the fat and so on, and then it is very painful. So you're getting from obstruction to strangulation. So keep that in mind, use the terms properly, obstruction, strangulation, incarceration. So here is the normal appearances, but let's look at the femoral hernia, right? The femoral hernia is usually medial to the vein. This is vein and artery, this is vein and artery. You place your probe here and you keep a lookout for this. Anything which comes out here and is compressing, slightly compressing the vein in this fashion, that is a typical femoral hernia. As you can see in neutral position, there is no femoral hernia. You're asking them to do Valsalva, and that is when you see this. So this is these are all subtle hernias. If you just scan them fast, you will miss them unless you're doing the dynamic evaluation. So that is a femoral hernia in this location. You never saw that on CT. When you look at the normal size, there is always some movement because there is a fat, but it doesn't compress the vein. The outline of the vein is not changed. Vein does expand a little bit because that's the normal Valsalva, right? Uh, but it is not as bad as this side here. This is a femoral hernia. This is the normal movement at the femoral space. Now, remember the femoral hernia is usually medial, but it can be posterior to the vein as well. Then it's called Serafini. And there are many different locations, including anterior to the vein, posterior to the vein, and medial to the vein as well. Medial to the vein is the most common part, which is what I showed you here. And this is the posterior to the vein. And when it comes, it actually compresses the vein so much. Here's another one posterior to the vein, indenting the femoral vein. So all these are different versions of femoral hernias. When it comes to hernia mimics, the first thing you should not get confused is the vein getting bigger and smaller and a little bit of fat moving, both of which, which we have discussed. Okay. Um, the other thing is the rectus, right? The rectus abdominis muscle, when it separates like this, but the fascia is still there, that is okay. That is diverification of rectus and it doesn't do much damage beyond that, okay? But if the diverification happens and you see something coming through that, then linea alba, then you are thinking in terms of a hernia, right? So remember that. Now, very quickly, I, I don't think, yeah, it's 850, well, yeah, 8.55 for me. I guess it's 8.55 for you as well. So maybe next five minutes, I'll just highlight two or three things about uh, sports hernia, okay? Number one, sports hernia, it's, they call it athletic pubalgia, groin pain, Gilmore anemia. There's a, the, it's a separate topic. It's a separate discussion. It's probably another lecture in itself. But what I want you to appreciate is that this try not to use the sports hernia because there's really no hernia um, that we see. It's, it's uh, basket terms for all kinds of pain. Uh, so you can, it can be rectus abdominis strain. It can be adductor longus strain, pubic symphysis, sclerosis, edema, pubic osteitis, whatever we used to call it in the past, stress fracture, injury, and, and it can also be some kind of inguinal hernias uh, when we have seen some of those cases. Right, a little bit about anatomy. See, the musculoskeletal anatomy, the more we can see the anatomy with high resolution ultrasound, MR, uh, the more we dissect and confirm what we see. Uh, one of them is that the rectus abdominis muscles will, some of these fibers will 
interchange as, as you see here. And some of the other fibers will continue with adductor longus as you see in this case. And the most important thing is all these things are also connected with the inguinal ligament and hence the superficial ring. So if they stretch, the superficial ring stretches and then you start getting the hernias, right? So you see what I mean? This is all connected uh, in that sense. Um, and then you can have problems with just erector longus, erectus abdominis itself. Like for example, in this MR, you see the erectus abdominis tear in the sagittal MR. In this axial one, you see thickening at the attachment site of the erectus. You see fluid at the attachment site of the erectus. So this is all erectus abdominis strain, which could be, which people will lump it under the, the sports hernia. So we'll not call that sports hernia, we'll just call it rectus abdominis sprain, or it can be a ductor sprain as well. These are better evaluated with MRI. So what is the role of ultrasound, right? We will talk about that as well. See, there's edema in the bone. We're never going to see this on uh, the ultrasound. Bone changes here, pubic osteitis, there is stress fracture here and so on. So once you get into the sports hernia question mark, you have to look and see what are they really worried about. If they're really worried about the inguinal hernias and all that we have discussed, yes, ultrasound. But if they don't know what they're dealing with that, maybe MR is better as a first line of investigation. So what do we do? So with the ultrasound, you can actually do the inferior pubic rema here, right? The adductor longus, brevis, and magnus attached to it. Um, so the adductors tears, can be identified with ultrasound. It is difficult, but once you start doing it in this region, you will identify the tears. What you cannot identify is mild amount of sprain or edema because that is much better seen with MRI. However, bigger tears can be seen very clearly with the uh, ultrasound itself. And then this is the discussion point. The the weakness of the posterior abdominal wall, the conjoint tendon, right? So the one where I talked about the direct hernia, this part, that some of the PMNR literature is talking about as the first sign of weakness, uh, pain uh, in the sports guys. So if you are looking for a bulge of the posterior abdominal wall, which goes higher up than the vessel. And again, you don't know whether you can call this a hernia yet because, because, because remember, we defined hernia as a defect between the fascia and the extrinsic and the, the stuff that coming through outside. Here it is just a bulge, okay? So that is what is happening here. The posterior abdominal wall, which is basically the conjoint tendon, the internal oblique and transverse abdominus is stretching and stuff is being pushed. And then you will see something like this. Here it is. And you go this and this is higher up compared to the artery. So this is exactly what is happening and that can cause pain. So the closest sports hernia thing that you can relate to in terms of what we discussed is actually a early direct hernia, okay? Uh, so this is what we talked about as a direct hernia, right? So that, that, that much amount I wanted to highlight before we end. So remember, a hernia is defined by its neck, okay? Uh, you want to confirm the presence of a uh, hernia by protrusion of a viscous through that defect. And the, wherever the neck is, that is what it is. If the neck is in the semilunaris area, it's pigelian. If the neck is lateral to the epigastric, it is a, uh, it's an indirect hernia. If it, the neck is in the Hesselbachs, it's a direct hernia. If it's the neck is in the femoral area, it's in the femoral, femoral hernia. And a good valsalva and a light application of transducer is a key for a successful technique. Remember, irreducibility and strangulation are key complications which should be immediately conveyed to the referring clinician because say, you know, the bowel viability is at storage here. When it comes to sports hernia, try not to use that term. Um, the only thing I want you to remember which comes closest to the sports hernia in terms of the hernias that we discussed is a very early direct hernia. Okay, so with that, I will stop here and uh, I can take questions. I'm sorry we lost five minutes uh, in between, but um, uh, let me know and I will, uh, you know, maybe stop sharing or, or I, can, I can take questions now, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yes. cool. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Grish. That was wonderful. No, no problem. That no, was no, 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 uh, no. very, very nice. You know, we struggle with this topic and we struggle with, yes. uh, with so many things. Uh, we hear so many lectures about her, but this one is really, really very clear to us, very systematic and uh, 
very, uh, I mean, right. very easy to follow. Uh, had we known this long time ago, we, we could have. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, we, we started doing this uh, as a musculoskeletal radiologist, and then suddenly we were getting more cases to do than the abdominal radiologists. Uh, be, because it, once you understand the anatomy and technique, and once you start doing a few of this, initially you'll struggle, but afterwards it becomes easy and it is very, very, very rewarding. But I understand that it is a very dry topic. It is very difficult to engage the audience for a long period of time with no landmarks, literally. A shoulder ultrasound is easier to talk. But if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to respond to right now. Okay, uh, there's one question here. Uh, right. Uh, Jojo, uh, Dr. Franklin, okay, wh why don't you uh, raise that question? Uh, excellent yep. lecture, Dr. Thank you. Uh, you've never seen it presented so nicely and clearly and very systematically. Thank you so much. Uh, yes. May I know if there are any nerves that may be compressed in this area and uh, if, uh, if hydrodissection may, may be of any help? Thank you, sir. Yes. So there is ilioinguinal nerve and heliohypogastric nerves. These are the two nerves which travel uh, in the walls of the inguinal canal and it go down the path. This is usually happening uh, in a huge big hernias, but more so when they put the mesh and they tie it up, there's the scar tissue which forms around the mesh and the nerves can get involved. So you go higher up in the, the abdomen, they come through the abdominal wall near the iliac crest and they come over this way. So if you hydro dissect, the, first of all, you will inject and block it and see if the pain is relieved. And then, then you know that the pain is coming from that. And there is, we can hydro dissect if we can actually see the nerve going through that area in a scar area. That is sometimes the only thing that you can be doing in this area. So if you have a good resolution ultrasound, uh, that is uh, a way to relieve pain. Thank you very much, Dr. No problem. Okay. Uh, Dr. Grish, uh, I have a very simple question, sure. uh, not re really related to ultrasound, but uh, how do you know if you have a very good Valsalva when you were, you're doing a, a, right. a, a scanning? Because I know the technique is, uh, you, just, you just say it's, it should yeah, be yeah. a very light touch. But the other thing is, how do you know that the patient has actually uh, done enough to do some Valsalva that could probably uh, elicit that kind of reaction? Right. So uh, two things. One, as, as you do more and more of these, uh, you'll realize that you can actually see just the bowel movement and decide whether the valsalva is good or not. But for the early things, as I told you in the first part of the lecture, just go to the femoral vein and see the expansion. So if you have valsalva, then the femoral vein, you will see a noticeable expansion of femoral vein. If you don't see the femoral vein expanding much, that means you're not getting good valsalva you will be struggling throughout. So you'll have to teach them how to do good well salva. It's very critical. With COVID, it is very difficult, right? So you have to put the mask on, then blow it up, or you have to bring bear it down. And, you know, it is a tough one. Most people get it, how to do well salva, after a few times when you teach them, most people, and then they will say, increase your abdominal pressure and it happens. But there are some people who will never do anything, in which case just stand them up and then ask them to do something and try so hopefully the gravity uh, does the trick uh, in those occasions. But the short answer to that is look at a femoral vein and see it expanding and you know the Valsalva is decent. I see. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. No Milane, go, go ahead. Milane, you have a question? Thank you very much for your sure. very, very good and well-presented lecture, Dr. Girish. No problem. You never uh, fail to amaze me with all your lectures. <laughs> I know I've heard you before and I always learn a lot. Okay, okay. My question is, are there instances where in the hernia or when you do dynamic, it will be confused with an enlarged lymph nodes? Um, so answer is uh, no. I can't think of any case where I have, or we had confusion between hernia and uh, lymph nodes. Um, so the lymph nodes can, they look different and they are in a slightly different location as well. And they don't demonstrate either coming towards the probe or moving this way. So 
unless if I was learning, maybe a direct hernia and a lymph node there could be confusing, but still it should not. So the answer, short answer is no, the lymph nodes and the hernia should not be confusing. Okay, so yeah, thank you for making that clear. So even though the lymph nodes are enlarged, it should still not confuse us. No, no. Okay, thank you. No problem. Okay, uh, there's another question, Dr. Girish here from yes. Pash. Pash, go ahead. Dr. Girish, thank you also for this lecture. Sure. I'm not one who's been doing this um, in my practice, so it might be a very simple question. Sure. Um, do you always use a linear probe or do we actually use a curvilinear probe? And for doing well, Salva, do we, are there instances where you ask the patient to actually stand up and, you know, do the maneuver or do you always let them do it supine? So, thank you. Uh, could you say the last part again, uh, the Valsalva part? Okay, so um, when, when you're asking the patient uh, for certain maneuvers, are there instances where you ask them to actually uh, stand up and, you know, uh, bear down so that you can see the actual hernia getting out? Or is it always in a supine position? Thank you. Oh, I see. Okay, no problem. So, yeah. So, I'll answer that question and then you may have to ask me the first question again. But uh, the... We will do both, okay? Supine question, supine position and standing position. And when you're doing supine position, you do Valsalva. The, be the best way, some people like if you put a pillow and then they can you can see them, then they do this. They use the hand and then you ask them to blow behind. Like that, okay? So you close your mouth and blow and then that is the easy way. The other people are just cough. But this problem is with COVID, you cannot ask them to do coughing. But that was an easy... <laughs> That was an easy one to do before COVID. So just say cough and then you, you, you're fine. Uh, you know, you get a thing. So you do both uh, standing and uh, sitting position to this thing. What was your first question again? Sorry. My first question, doctor, was when you choose the probe, you know. Yes. Okay. I got it. I got it. Yeah. Yeah. So the linear probe is better because, see, the anatomy is very close. Uh, the these inguinal ligament and the spermatic cord are literally millimeters away. And then if you come down below the inguinal ligament, there is femoral vein and so on. So almost always, almost always, okay, we do only linear probe. Now, in Michigan, we do have some gravitationally challenging patients. So when, when, they have, when, when there is huge amount of body mass and subcutaneous fat, you will have to try the curvy linear. At that time, your specificity for diagnosing, or is this femoral or direct will be low, but at least you can diagnose a hernia and that is good enough. So you will have to go to that if it has to, but most of this anatomy, despite all that fat they may have, is doable with a linear probe. You just have to move the fat and look at it, okay? So the answer is 90 to 95% of the times, linear transducer is good enough. You don't have to go to the uh, curvy linear. Thank you, doctor. No problem, sure. Okay, Dr. Grish, uh, one quick question on the sports hernia. Right. Uh, you mentioned about the conjoint tendon that's uh, the form by the right. internal oblique and your transversus abdominis. Uh, <clears throat> is the sports hernia also, or is it right to say that the sports hernia is actually also the rectus abdominis and the adductor longus yes. being affected? Yes, so the sports hernia is usually the rectus abdominis and the erector longus, that's usual, that they're more common. Uh, whatever you call sports hernia, you should look for those places first. It is also the, the pubic symphysis area can get affected, stress fractures, what is called pubic osteitis, it's actually not inflammation, it is just mechanical changes. That is also in the differential. And then if you move on, all these things can create weakness of the superficial ring. So then posterior abdominal wall weakness, and, and then you, and what looks like a direct hernia coming through as well. Now the sportsman people can also get indirect hernia and femoral hernia because whatever they're doing, there's increasing the abdominal uh, pressure all the time and they can get those hernias too. So it is a big basket term. I was just trying to explain that don't, number one, don't use that term because it's very confusing. And if you want to, if somebody has sent you an ultrasound for a rule of sports hernia, do look for all these things like indirect, direct, whatever we talked about, but the most the co most common thing among this set of hernias 
that you are likely to find in the guy who is doing a lot of sports would be the direct version with a weakness of the conjoint thing. We would still look at the rectus abdominis and the adductors. Best thing is to ask where is the pain. Let's look at it to see if there is a tear or not. If at the beginning itself, you knew that you're worried about more about rectus abdominis and so on, it may be a good idea to actually do an MR rather than an ultrasound. I see. And uh, one last question sure. uh, is, uh, uh, we also encounter a lot of patients with, uh, of course, iliosoas, uh, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a snapping of the iliosoas tendon. Yeah, Would this yeah. interfere with your diagnosis with, with hernias in the sense no. that when you try to move the probe, you might reach a point where actually there's also some pain in that lateral area, just no, close you, to the iliosoas tendon? Yeah, so a lot of people, when they talk about um, the groin pain, they include the anterior hip as well as under the, under the discussion point, which is fine. But when you really are looking at a practical application of how do I do hernias, um, the iliopsoas tendon is far, far away laterally. Uh, so you will, that will not be in that inguinal canal region. Remember, inguinal canal is from midpoint of the inguinal ligament to the pubic tubercle. It's a very small area. The, uh, the iliopsoas is further away. Now, if the pain is coming from that area and the patient is not able to tell you where the pain is, then you will look for that area and maybe identify pathologies which are related to the hip. And we can talk about that some other time. But if you're doing strictly hernia protocol, iliopsoas tendon pathologies will not be confusing you. That will not be in the, in the differential uh, for the hernia part of it. Well, thank you very much, Dr. No Girish. It's, it's, it's really fun and cool to right. be listening to you. <laughs> the next time around, you will be holding a guitar and, you know. Yes, I will, I will try. And, I might do a better job with that. <laughs> <laughs> it was, you're, it was you're, fun, fun, yes. Yeah, you're indeed the rock star of ultrasound and out rock star band uh, leader. Also yes, yeah, that, that'll be perfect, yes. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah. we run an ultrasound course at the University of Michigan, myself, Dr. Jacobson, and so on. So if you ever come uh, here or if you ever want to do that, it usually happens before the RSNA. So by all means, even by if you want to observe something, just feel free to reach out. I had pleasure talking to all of you guys, and I hope to see you in person somewhere, you know, maybe next year or so. Uh, good luck, okay? And uh, reach yeah. out me, to me if there are any questions as well. Uh, is it okay to uh, for them to get your uh, email, Dr. Girish? Yes, yes. Uh, so okay. it's, uh, I can, f do you have my email? You have my email, yeah, have, right? Yeah, I have yeah your, you, can pass, I have you can pass it on to them, yes. Okay, great, great. So, well, thank you very much for this lecture. And uh, we look forward to part two. The post-surgical. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, we should. Yes, oh, well, let, let's do that sometime. That is even yeah, more boring, uh, but that is more useful too. I can make it smaller too for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that, would, that okay. would be a very nice sequel of this lecture, the sure. post-surgical thing, yeah. Well, uh, have a good day. And, okay, thank uh, you. Take care and uh, be safe wherever you are. And uh, okay. hopefully we can meet you in person and bring you yes. here in the Philippines as well. Yeah, I'm uh, looking together, forward to that, yes. Yeah, together with Dr. Jan, if uh, all these things are over. So sure. God bless you and your family. Take care. Thank you.